The peace, blessings, and mercy of God be upon you. When trains appeared, they made a big leap in the world of transportation. This is because the train is walking on its rails in a specific path. Therefore, there are no necessary obstacles to hinder it or to stop it. This ensures that he can travel great distances in a short time. But the strange thing remains is how the train, while moving at the high speeds that it can reach, remains fixed on the tracks without falling or deviating to the right or left, especially since the bars are very thin. Welcome. I am Mohammed Salah. The idea of trains or wagons that walk on rails in general appeared for the first time in its modern form in Germany in the year 1550 AD, specifically in the areas where coal mines were located. People at the time had great difficulty moving the loaded wagons on the regular dirt roads especially since the cars were pulled by horses at the time. The plan was that they make a track of solid material and fix the wheels of the carts on it. It facilitates the movement of carts. And they did. They prepared long beams of wood, put them side by side, and fixed the chariots on them, and the horses began to pull them. In order for it to be the first means of transportation similar to the idea of the current train, and its name was then Fagan Way. With time, the topic began to develop more and more. And the single carriage began to develop, so there were two or three train carriages connected to each other. There are also seats for people inside the vehicles. And the wooden beams that were in the ground turned with time into solid iron bars. Starting in February 1804 AD, horses were replaced by engines when the first ever steam engine locomotive was made. Until now, the world is pink and the situation is beautiful. The real problems would start to appear when those in charge of developing the railways would start the stage of increasing the speed of trains so that they could travel longer distances in less time. Because they discovered that the tow, in this case deviates from its path, leaving the rails completely and falling off them. When the trains first appeared, their tires were a regular cylinder. Just a wheel they put on the rails and it moves. And this smooth circular shape would have made any lateral force, such as wind or vibration, affect the train and make it deviate from the track. Not only that, another problem arose. Those in charge of developing railways discovered that trains only run in straight lines. I mean, if they are working on the rails, bending to the right or left, for example, to change the direction of the diameter. The wheels just fall off the rails, for no apparent reason. No matter how hard they try to get the train to change course, they always fail. The train will still be walking very straight. But in the circular directions, it was as if he had gone insane. Until the year 1789, when the Englishman William Jessop came to them and said to them, Oh. People, no matter how hard you try, let the diameter walk in the curve. The topic will not work, they asked him why, William. He told them, because it is simply related to mathematics. William told them that if we have a circular road consisting of two curves, especially if these two curves are parallel and drawn from the same center as the curve on the outside, naturally its length will be longer than the curve on the inside. Like this picture in front of us. The red curve is much longer than the green curve. This is the nature of drawing curves in this case. This means that the wheel of the train on the red curve needs to travel a greater distance than the wheel on the green curve. And since the two wheels are connected to each other, this will not work. Does this mean that there is no solution? William told them, mathematically, the solution is to keep one wheel larger than the other in size. And this is because the wheel, when its size is larger, will move a longer distance with one lap at the wheel. That will walk on the red curve and we will make it larger than the wheel that will walk on the green curve. Very well, William, they replied. We will make this wheel big and this wheel small. The issue remains resolved. The strange thing is that William said to them, who told you that this is how the problem was solved? Although the solution is mathematically sound, it does not work in practice. A train cannot have a big wheel and a small wheel. This is because the two wheels will remain connected to each other. Therefore, if we put them on the rails, in this case we will find that one of them is touching the rail and the other is not. This means that the train will not run at all. So the question is, what should we do? We now want a magical solution. Leaves the two wheels on the rails at the same level. But when there is a carousel, one of them gets bigger and the other gets smaller. 
and after the circular direction passes, each wheel of them returns to its normal size. Although the issue appears as a joke or William found a solution for it, and a simple solution as well, which is that we use conical wheels. In order to solve the problem, he decided to replace the circular wheels with other conical wheels. Like the one in the picture before us, these are the conical wheels. We will also notice that the calf is not placed on the tracks, but it stays inside the bars for a while. In this case the wheel is still touching the rod from a fixed point, which is roughly the middle of the cone. And the one in our picture is the blue line. In this situation, when the road remains straight, you will not notice much difference between the conical design and the regular wheels. But as soon as the diagonal decides that it takes a curved direction and heads to the north, for example, we will begin to notice the role that the cone plays. As we said a while ago, why does the train successfully take a turn? We need the wheel on the outside to be higher. And the wheel inside is smaller in height. But the amazing thing here is that this is exactly what will happen in the case of the cone. At the beginning of the train taking a turn, the outer wheel will center on the last point at the base of the cone. And the wheel inside will be centered on the first point at the beginning of the cone, which is the green line. I mean, at that time, the wheel on the right was big and the wheel on the left was really small. This will make the train as if it is walking on two wheels of different sizes exactly as we want. Once the curve is cleared and the centrifugal force is gone, the wheels will return to normal again. Despite the simplicity of the idea, it solved many problems regarding the movement of trains. And they were widely applied and they are still used to this day. And if you look at any train yourself, you will notice that its wheels are cone-shaped. But is a cone only useful in the case of curves? Actually no. The geometric shape of the cone is one of its advantages that when it is moving and its base is towards the inside it makes outcome of the force due to the movement be the same as the inside. This means that if the toe is walking in a straight line and something external affects it and makes its wheels deviate slightly to the right or left. The form in which it is supposed to resist this external influence. And the train will go back inside again. And there is a famous experiment spread in many videos on YouTube through which they test this topic and see how far conical wheels are in maintaining stability. Finally, one of the important additional factors that make the diameter preferably fixed on the rod without falling. It is the metal flange or flange, which is a protrusion from the side of the base of the cone and it works as an additional safety valve for the wheels. If a lateral force came, it would affect the train greatly and the conical shape of the wheels alone would not be able to resist it. However, it also has an important role in the transfers of the train. And it is the one who relies on it mainly to change the track of the train from one rail to the other and in the end, not all periods need conical wheels in order to move on the rails easily. Rather, not all trains even need wheels to move. We can see this in modern trains, which are like the magnetic train or the suspended train. And the idea that he works with is simple, that a group of magnets is installed in the base of the train from underneath, and then a group of superconducting coils is installed on both sides of the railway. This combination creates a magnetic field that repels each other. Something like the repulsion that occurs when two magnets are brought close to each other in terms of similar poles. This dissonance raises the train up as if the train is literally flying. And this topic saves, of course, and it has an important advantage is that there is no friction. That is why these trains can move at exorbitant speeds, reaching up to 600 km per hour. And Delki trains do not need to walk on rails in the shape of the letter V. And then again, the base of the train is clamped in the letter V from below. So that if the magnetic force was not enough to keep the train in place, the train is preferably clipped to its own bar. And of course, because the train here is not two separate wheels, it walks on them as it turns right or left, which makes the process much easier. Just like that, and don't forget, if there is a question that comes to you at night or during the day and confuses you, write it to us in the comments under the video so that we can answer it. Most of the cases we do will be in take from your comments. Goodbye.